After the war exploded in Europe with the invasion of Poland, both Britain and France declared war on Germany, and the very first raids were about to begin. At the time, the fourth group of the Royal Air Force was the only trained night bomber force in the entire world, and the reliable Armstrong Whitworth Whitley would have to bear the brunt of the first aerial missions over Germany, Italy, and the rest of occupied Europe until a more advanced aircraft came around. On the first night of the war, the Whitley had the critical task of bombing several German cities, making it the first Royal Air Force Bomber Command to penetrate the enemy nation. But when the squadron approached its target, and the Whitleys released their bomb load, it wasn't precisely explosives that fell on top of the German population. Ugly yet reliable. The British military was preparing for the upcoming war as early as the summer of 1934. That July, the Air Ministry issued Specification B-334, seeking a replacement for the Handley Page Hayford biplane bomber. The requirement called for a heavy night bomber and troop transport as part of the Royal Air Force's concept. Back then, the British Empire demanded aircraft that could fight wars in remote locations. Such aircraft were conceived to fly into the theater of action carrying troops and providing aerial support. In response, the chief designer of Armstrong Whitworth Aircraft, John Lloyd, submitted the AW-38 design, a derivative of the AW-23 bomber transport that had already lost to the Bristol bomber. Later, that design would be named after the location of the corporation's main factory at Whitley. The new aircraft showed impressive initial promise, and the first batch of 80 models was delivered in mid-1935. Yet, the prototype's maiden flight didn't occur until March of 1936. The end product did not impress many, but it was said to continue a tradition of unappealing yet reliable heavy bombers that excelled during the early years of the war. Chin up. The Whitley design was a basic twin-engine aircraft with a cantilever monoplane with retractable undercarriage. However, it was classified as a heavy bomber and eventually earned the distinction of being the first RAF aircraft with a semi-monocoque fuselage. The AW-38 Whitley drew heavily from the AW-23, particularly regarding its wing structure. Curiously enough, early versions did not have flaps, as the chief designer was unfamiliar with them on large, heavy monoplanes. Consequently, the mid-set wings were set at a high angle of incidence at 8.5 degrees to compensate. While the modification did confer the bomber's good takeoff and landing performance, the engineers included the use of flaps later in the design phase. Even so, the wing remained unaltered, and the Whitley would have a pronounced nose-down attitude when flying at cruising speed, which caused considerable drag. Among the most identifiable features of the series, its protruding chin stood out. This feature was accentuated by the angled-down format of the cockpit and nose section. Shortly before the first prototype took to the air, operational models followed in the form of two Marks. The initial order consisted of 34 Mark I's and 46 Mark II's, with minor differences between the two. However, after the first 34 aircraft left the production line, the power plant was changed and standardized on all Marks. The most prominent distinction was that the Mark I was equipped with a Tiger IX radial engine, while the Mark II was given a Tiger VIII. Indeed, several engine types were fitted to Whitley's until the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine was used in 1938, which translated into a significant improvement in performance. Both engines drove a three-bladed position variable pitch propeller. Older Brother The Whitley was the first of three British frontline medium bombers in service with the RAF when it was introduced. The model joined the number 10 squadron as early as March of 1937, and was then delivered to the 58th squadron in January of 1938 and the 51st squadron that August. By the time the war broke out, almost 200 models allocated to seven squadrons were already operational, including the newer Mark III and Mark IV variants. Soon, the Whitley became what most experts considered the most important design in the Armstrong-Whitworth portfolio. 
For all that, the Mark I would still be in service by the time the aggressions began in Europe, but the Mark III and Mark IV appeared shortly after. The Mark III introduced a retractable ventral gun, while the Mark IV had differing radial power plants of the more powerful Rolls-Royce line. When operating as a bomber, the AW-38 would usually carry a crew of five, a pilot, navigator, nose gunner or bomb aimer, wireless operator, and rear gunner. The five members were positioned in different parts of the aircraft, manning systems or defensive weaponry. Later on, the standard armament suite included a single 7.7mm machine gun fitted on the nose, with a complement of four other machine guns arrayed in a powered turret assembly at the tail. And in terms of ordnance, the bomber could carry a bomb load of up to 7,000 pounds. Still, the model's first cargo was not one of the bombs, but a more subtle and psychologically inclined payload. Outings The Whitley fleet was the first to fly over Germany that fateful September of 1939. Notably, the Whitley was the only one of the twin-engine bombers conceived from the outset for night operations. As such, the operational Whitley squadrons were sent on nickel sorties over the Ruhr Valley on the first night of the war. The bombers were not tasked with bombing German cities. Instead, they dropped thousands of propaganda leaflets, intending to appeal to the population and convince them that they were on the wrong side of the conflict. They also raided Italian territory mere hours after the country joined the Axis forces. In 1941, they were deployed to serve in the first paratrooper operation of the war in southern Italy. And for Operation Colossus, airborne troops were delivered by Whitley bombers on February 10th. They would attempt to destroy an aqueduct that supplied fresh water to several Italian armed forces. However, equipment failures and navigational errors caused a significant part of the explosives and Royal Engineer sappers to land in the wrong area. But despite the setback, the team managed to destroy the aqueduct and boosted the morale of the fledgling airborne establishment. Nevertheless, the Italians were able to repair the damage quickly, and the operation did not have the desired impact in the end. The first night sorties provided the air crews with the necessary experience to operate and navigate in the dark. Soon, the squadrons became actively involved in all sorts of operations, including mine laying and submarine patrols, as well as bombings. Even so, it is said that the bomber was already obsolete by the time the war started, but another batch of aircraft was underway while a suitable replacement was selected. Indeed, the model covered a critical role in bomber command operations until the advent of four-engined aircraft in 1942. Nonetheless, the definitive bomber variant of the series had not yet been introduced. The Brunt of the Effort For many experts, the Mark V and the following Mark VII were the most important iterations of the model, built explicitly for anti-submarine warfare and also used for the maritime reconnaissance role with Coastal Command. The specialized versions featured additional fuel capacity, ASV radar, and an extra crew member that covered the radar operator role. The changes increased the aircraft's all-up weight from 21,680 pounds to 33,950 pounds, and their operational range was extended to 3,700 kilometers, which was 1,400 kilometers larger than previous variants. The appearance of the Mark V signified the beginning of high-level, deep-striking missions into occupied territories in Europe, and the model would bear the brunt of the effort. Notably, the AW-38 also supported clandestine operations of resistance groups across occupied countries. During the first half of the war, the Whitley was mostly deployed in night bombing operations over Germany, in addition to its famous and widespread leaflet raids. Besides, it would also serve as a glider tug, taking part in delivering airspeed Horsa gliders during the Battle of Normandy and the D-Day landings. The Whitley was eventually rolled out with the introduction of the so-called heavies, like the Avro Lancaster. In all, 269 examples were lost in action during the war. A pleasure to fly. Outperformed and vulnerable to ever-improving enemy assaults at either day or night, the Whitley was soon phased out in favor of the next generation of British and American bombers. 
More modern aircraft had enhanced long-range heavy strike capabilities and a superior defense. Having played its part in the war, the Whitley bowed out of the front line in the spring of 1942 after the last Bomber Command raid, but production would continue until 1943. Meanwhile, many functional examples were converted into training aircraft and continued in service. Remarkably, some training aircraft were called back to action in May of that year in the Thousand Bomber raid on Cologne. All in all, and across all six variants, a total of 1,815 AW-38s were built, the most prominent one being the Mark V, with roughly 1,500 examples. After an adventurous and pivotal career, the Whitley was retired in 1945. It had proven a sturdy aircraft, generally liked by its crews. With nary a problem, the model was said to be a pleasure to fly, if only a bit slow. However, it provided the Royal Air Force with a much-needed offensive vehicle, when it most needed it. Thank you for watching Dark Skies. If you enjoyed our video, please hit the thumbs up button and check out the rest of our Dark Documentaries channels for many more epic encounters of modern history. Also, make sure to activate the notifications to be up to date with our latest content and stay tuned for more.